I really enjoy verse by verse Bible study because it's like understanding more about the mind of God, what He's trying to tell us. And literally, literally every standing, every single word in that book. That's my intention to teach you so that every one of you can feel like you understand everything going on in that verse. So that's your preacher's intention, and he tried to do that. Okay, let's look at Revelation chapter 16, actually. Revelation 16. As you might recall, Revelation 16 is God pouring out the seven vials. So within these seven vials is containing the wrath of God. And within the wrath of God is the plagues over here. And then within these plagues, it's amazing how the people, that they will not repent. That's what you're going to find out throughout all this chapter. And then we're going to look at some interesting things as we look at these vials in Revelation chapter 16. Let's look at a few interesting things. We will start off at verse 4, but before I go to verse 4, let's freshly review so you remember. Verse 2 was a disease, and we see that as to be leprosy. And then verse 3 is the second vial, which is turning the sea to blood. So let me draw this out real quickly. That way everyone can be in proper context of understanding what is going on so far with the vials. Now, I'm going to draw this out too. The reason why I'm going to draw it out is because it's going to follow within a context of the trumpets and how these vials relate to each other. So it's kind of interesting. As I, show, as I sh draw it out, you're going to see how they're kind of all interrelated. You'll better understand it as I keep teaching. Okay, now, let's look at verse 4. The third angel poured out his vial. So the third angel, he's pouring out the third vial. Remember, e there are each angel pouring out the vial with it. Upon the rivers and fountains of waters, and they became blood. So notice over here, the first one was the sea. The second one is within the fountains of waters as well as the rivers. Now, why did God put blood in them too? Because mankind, obviously, they keep resisting God's judgment. So a good example was within Hurricane Katrina, uh, where New Orleans was ruined of their homosexual par uh, parade. What did they do after the hurricane? They, they resisted. They still did it anyways out of defiance to God. So think about it, where God puts the blood in the seas, mankind is going to resist the judgment, and what are they going to do? They're going to protect it with their technology. So, hey, we got enough water reserve, we'll be fine, you know. And then Bill Gates is, uh, he, I don't know if you knew this, but he was inventing this device, and he was on uh, the Jimmy Fallon show where they took sewage, and then they were making it drinking water. So despite of the brilliance of mankind, Hey, so we got the waters covered. What God's going to do is when Bill Gates drinks that poop water, he'll probably revert back to poop and blood, and then he'll be drinking it down and go like that, you know? What, what is God going to do? He's trying to teach and show mankind that despite of your intellectual achievement, scientific technology, you still can't get away from my judgment. He's trying to humble them. So will man repent finally and say, okay, God, I'm not going to rely on my scientific power, on my own strength. I'm going to finally repent, get right with you. Well, look at verse 5. And I heard the angel of the water say. Okay, now that's interesting. So notice that there is an angel of the waters. And we're not talking about the seven angels up here. We're talking about an angel down here. So angels do not have wings, uh, but I'm just drawing this. That way people can better understand. Now, there are some onliners who told me that angels do have wings, uh, but no, they do not. Um, if you look at our beginner's discipleship videos, it'll explain why angels do not have wings. But I just won't get over there, okay? But for now, there's an angel of the waters. Now, remember, if you look back at Revelation 2 and 3, there's an angel of the what? Seven churches, right? 
And God was, when God was speaking to the church, he was, it, the verse did not say he was speaking directly to the people of the church. He was speaking to the who? The angel. Why? Because your pastor told you what did angel mean? Angel, Dr. Upman mentioned it meant, uh, that angel meant a representation. So then Dr. Upman mentioned that, <coughs> child, uh, that the children, their angels do behold them, and etc. He was saying that an angel basically is a representation of an object or you, so to speak. Me, I mentioned over here that it's a representation or a representative. That way, uh, I say representative, that way it could be less confusing for the people. Kind of like uh, the United States of America, if you want to know the actions of it, you have a person representing the country or an ambassador for it, right? So that's the reason why I put it like this way, that way people can better understand it, where an angel is a representation or representing the person or object. So over here then, that's why it says angel of the waters. It makes sense. Why? Because you got to look at this. It's not just people yeah. that angels are going to be representatives of, but it's all of God's creation. Yeah, that's, right. that's very interesting then. So then, <clears throat> where people were either uh, polluting the waters deliberately or people were sinning in the waters deliberately, like uh, beach parties, you know, the Daytona Beach and stuff like that, or whatever, or, or God forbid, whatever they're doing at the waters, whatever sin comes out of the waters, the angel, there's a representative of those waters. And God's going to recall it. And then when he judges and does something, there's a representative who will know about it and who will sense it. And guess what? That's why the angel receives the rebuke from God at Revelation 2 and 3, even though the angel is not at fault. Why? Because the angel... He's not the one at fault when God's rebuking. God's just rebuking because the angel is representing the whole church. Basically, that intermediary uh, tool or instrument. That's the idea. So that's going to be the same thing with the waters. So because the angel is like that intermediate tool with God and the waters, the angel, because why? Waters are physical objects that cannot speak. Angels are spiritual objects that can speak. So the angel, which is the spiritual plane, so when God affects the waters with judgment, the waters aren't going to cry out to the Lord, just and true are your ways. It's that angel that's going to speak out to God. Now what's very interesting, however, is that if you look... At Revelation 5, which we looked at earlier, and not only that, other passages in the Old Testament, it talks about where nature practically looks like it's animated and even shouting and clapping the hand saying, glory to God in the highest. So what could be going on then is this, is that it could be there are two things, is that if we're looking at the spiritual level, it's those angels that are speaking out. That's one or number two, because nothing is impossible with God, God could transform from that spiritual plane where the angel's speaking into something more literal, where the object itself is giving praise to the Lord. So that's why your pastor mentioned at Revelation 5, it talked about uh, all of God's <clears throat> creation and creatures voicing out and praising the Lord before the first seal of the tribulation is unleashed. So then your pastor joked about, you know, imagine that we all got raptured to heaven and then the professor is teaching in the middle of the class, there is no God, and the bird flew over, over flew the professor's head and then landed on his shoulder and he said, ain't God good, praise God, and then the professor freaks out, ah, what's going on? <laughs> so then your pastor mentioned about that at Revelation 5, that that's what it really looked like. So we see this concerning about angel of the waters and this is not the only time we see the angel of the waters again before in scriptures you might say really so if you look at the book of john remember at the pool there's an angel that goes over the pool why so that the people who touch the water can be healed that can be healed now if that's the case i don't know if that healing may be also applied 
during the tribulation if people want to receive baptism. But that's a whole other story. I'm not going to really get into that one. So I'm not sure if that might have anything to do with that, possibly. Let's look at verse 5. Uh, the, I heard the angel of the water say, so what is this angel saying? Thou art righteous, O Lord. So he's saying God is righteous for the judgment, which art and was. So God is, present tense, was, past tense, and shall be. He is future. He's everywhere. Because thou hast judged thus. So God is righteous in that judgment. He is right for punishing people. People, we live in a day and age that when people are punished for their iniquity, they see that more as inhumane. They see that as something more to be avoided and negative. But in the Bible, it actually says, no, it's righteous. It has to be done. That's the reason why every generation gets worse. Why? Because there is not that punishment that's laid out where people take things seriously, the consequences of their actions. <clears throat> All right. Look at verse 6. Why? Is God righteous in that judgment? Verse 6 says, For they have shed the blood of saints and prophets. Because this wicked world shed the blood of all of God's saints and prophets before. So because they shed their blood, God, that's why he judged them with blood. Now that's interesting. Notice it says saints and prophets, right? So because this is concerning about saints and prophets... That means then, this is for all time, not just during the tribulation. So notice over here that the world is held accountable. So wait, are you telling me then if the rapture were to happen 2020 and we reach the year 2027 during near the end of the tribulation, that world or our next generation will be held accountable for the blood of these people? Yes. You might say, why is that? Well, we see this similar example. Go to Matthew 23. Matthew 23. Now, this is where we get into really interesting study about the spiritual world. And this, I believe, should be one of the rules of in, uh, biblical interpretation or hermeneutics. You might say, really? <clears throat> this kind of relates to the angel of the waters. When you read the Bible, you've got to also look not just at your 3D level of a world, a physical level. You have to look at a different, another dimension, and that's a spiritual dimension. If you think about that when you're reading scriptures, it's going to be hugely eye-opening like dispensationalism. Like, for example, let me give an example here. It, uh, when, I, uh, when I mentioned about uh, the angel of the waters, see, if the waters itself is crying out to God, it may not make sense to us. So a lot of us may think that the Lord may have done that literally, which is possible. But it could be even better. It would make a lot more sense, actually, if you say spiritually they're speaking out to God. How so? Because of the angel that's representing them. Here's another example. Another example is God was speaking to the king of Tyrus, Ezekiel chapter 28. Mm -hmm. But he was speaking about Satan. He was speaking to Satan. So uh, the king of Tyrus was not in the Garden of Eden when you read Ezekiel 28. That doesn't make sense. Unless God was speaking to the spirit that was within King Cyrus. There's something spiritual that could be within pretty much uh, within, within our world, 3D world today, there could be something spiritual involved. That's the point. That's the point, which is intensely interesting that you need to know. And this could be very eye-opening when you read the scriptures. <clears throat> this is why a lot of people didn't understand when Jesus said, if you eat my flesh and drink my blood, then you won't have life in you. A lot of people didn't understand that because they took that literally. But Jesus was speaking about that spiritually. He has an invisible spiritual body that we all are a part of. So because of that, in a sense, we are drinking and eating and being nourished by it. Yeah. See that? So because of that, in a spiritual level, we are eating 
his flesh and drinking his blood. Why? Because we're a part of the body of Christ. See? So that's why it is very important to understand <clears throat> a lot of Bible believers have this problem is that you better be careful of literal interpretation. Literal interpretation should be the very first rule of Scripture, but you got to realize this is that when you, this does not ignore the rest of hermeneutics. So if the other rules of hermeneutics plainly trump this one, and where literal interpretation is impossible or makes less logical sense, then that's where you're going to have to let the other rules of hermeneutics triumph. And one of them is spiritual. As a matter of fact, even if you keep reading the Bible literally, you're going to find out that one verse that you took literally is contradicted by later verses that are taken literally. So, for example, Jesus says, uh, eat my flesh, drink my blood, or you won't have life in you, right? So, okay, so let's take that literally. No, if you keep reading later on, there's a verse that contradicts it, which, which Jesus says, it is the spirit that quickeneth, the flesh profiteth nothing. The words that I speak unto you, eat my flesh, drink my blood, they are what? Spirit, they are life. See, so by taking that verse literally, that contradicts the previous literal statement, right? So then, you can see a spiritual interpretation behind it. So, the rules of hermeneutics go like this, is that when you read the literal interpretation, just keep reading it literally. And then you'll find out other literal verses contradicting the literal interpretation. And then you'll also think about other rules of hermeneutics, the spiritual interpretation behind it. Look at the context. That's another important rule within biblical hermeneutics. If you look at context, context will really show that the literal interpretation will not work then. <clears throat> okay, but that's a short uh, abbreviation of biblical hermeneutics. I'm going to teach that at advanced discipleship. That's one of my favorites, actually, biblical hermeneutics. The key foundation, obviously, in biblical hermeneutics is dispensationalism. Amen. That is very ingrained. If you don't divide verses when you're reading it and interpreting the Bible, it really messes up 90% of doctrine in our world. Amen. But see, they take that rule dividing to the extreme too, right? Yeah. That's why there's hyper-dispensationalists. And so because of that, that ignores the other rules of biblical hermeneutics. Okay, anyways, I've talked enough. Let's go back over here. I hope that you learned a lot from that. Oh, I mentioned Matthew 23, so let me explain that real briefly. Now, notice that the Pharisees and Sadducees, that they are held accountable for the sin of the saints and prophets before as well. Look at Matthew chapter 23, <clears throat> verse 34. Wherefore, behold, I send unto you prophets and wise men and scribes, and some of them ye shall kill and crucify. Some of them shall ye scourge in your synagogues and persecute them from city to city that upon you may come all the righteous blood shed upon the earth, from the blood of what? Righteous, righteous Abel unto what? Blood. blood of Zacharias, son of Berechias. That's beginning to end of Old Testament, that God held those Pharisees, Sadducees accountable for the sin. Not just them, the whole city of Jerusalem. Wait a minute, during that time, they didn't kill Abel. That's why the Pharisees and Sadducees got mad at Jesus. Like, we, we didn't think about killing anybody. Why, how dare you accuse us of killing somebody? Yeah. But see, they had a spirit inside them yes, that carried out that murder. That's why Jesus, when he looked at them, he said what? He said, ye are of your father the devil. The lust of your father ye will do. He was a murderer from the beginning. And guess what? That proved to be true. Those Pharisees were lying. We didn't kill anybody. No, they crucified Jesus naked later on. Yes. So a lot of people, see, that's what's going on. The Pharisees weren't aware how wicked they would become because of the spirit inside them. Just like the world at 2027, your next generation, they're totally blind. Uh, talk to the liberal universities and professors and tell them you're the one that killed the prophets back then. You're the ones that are persecuting Christians today. And th they're going to accuse you, and they don't understand that. But see, they have a same spirit. That's the thing. They have a same spirit that has actually killed and persecuted those Christians. I mean, look, what's the difference of the spirit of Hitler 
who uh, not just uh, massacred Jews, but even Christians who took care of the Jews. What's the difference with him with liberal university professors today who are against Hitler and Nazism? You might say, no, they don't have the same spirit. Yeah, they both have the same spirit. You know what it is? They both have the same spirit where they deny the word of God. See that? If there are professors who do not believe God exists. So think about the difference with them and Stalin back then. Who killed more than Hitler? What's the difference with Stalin in today's atheist world? Not much different. Well, Stalin killed millions. How could these atheists be held accountable? They both hold the same atheist spirit. See, that's why you got to understand. This will, that's why this spiritual interpretation, when you look at a spiritual dimension, it makes a lot more sense. That's why Revelation 2 and 3 becomes very powerful in opening up your understanding. We do know Revelation 2 and 3 is talking about the Roman Catholic Church being the enemy system during that whole time of Revelation 2 and 3. Balak, Balaam, Jezebel, you know, the seat where Satan's seat is, as Smyrna, etc. We all attribute that to Roman Catholic, even though it doesn't say Roman Catholic Church in there. And the Roman Catholic system gets upset and says, we're not the Nicolaitans, we're not Balaam, Balak. No, because look at the spirit that was behind Jezebel. See, look at the uh, idolatry and fornication, which is attributed to Babylon the Great, Revelation 17. Uh, deifying a woman, Virgin Mary. See, uh, Balak and Balaam, power in politics and in religion, but it's false and they do it for money. Guess what? That's what the Vatican shares in the same spirit. They make billions. And they're secular in power like Balak, but also religious in power like Balaam. Nicolaitans, thinking they're above the laity. That's the Roman Catholic Church. You talk to a normal Catholic how to get saved, they'll say, well, talk to my priest. Talk to my pope. Why? Because they're above the laity. They have special degrees. They graduated in schools that you didn't. See, so it's that same spirit. In Revelation 2, 3, we attribute it to the Catholic Church. So this is very eye-opening in biblical hermeneutics. I hope that you will remember that. That will change a lot of how you interpret verses, okay? All right. That's why we see Revelation 2 and 3. We know that historically that it's talking about uh, the local churches of that time, right? But if you look, but we say the spiritual application is what? To the church age, right? Why do we say that? Because... When God is speaking to those local churches during John's time period, he was speaking about the spirit that would be affected during the entire church age. See, it's all a spirit. When you read the verses, you can see a lot of what is spiritual in those words match to a T to everything that happened to the spirit that happened to the church age. See, that will, that's why you can't be a hyper dispensationalist. They don't even uh, take that as local churches during John's time period historically or to uh, the spiritual application to church age. They just jump that to tribulation doctrine. You can't do that. You can't just take it doctrinally. You got to take it spiritually. Because if they say this is doctrinally only to tribulation, you miss a lot of the spiritual application in Revelation 2 and 3 that directly match with the spiritual uh, application and activity that happened during the 2,000 years of church history, the church age. Yeah. And besides, your pastor already proved at Revelation 1 and Revelation 2 how the seven churches of Revelation 2 and 3 has to apply and include the church, whole church age era. Mm -hmm. Okay, I talked enough on biblical hermeneutics. Okay, let's go back to Revelation. But I hope that was very eye-opening. Okay. Revelation... Because it's a book of prophecy, you have to talk about rules of hermeneutics here. And your pastor went in depth a lot on those things, right? About not just one application, but double application. About looking at historical, spiritual, doctrinal application. About looking at revelation, not from a preterist point of view, but a dispensational point of view. About a spiritual application, Revelation 16. Think about this then why do you think other Revelation Bible studies you're going to listen to can be wrong? Whether it be a hyper-dispensational platform where they're overtly dividing, or to a milky church where they just take everything devotionally. 
See that? Or to these educated scholars and Calvinists who only look at it from a historical perspective. Why are those Bible studies going to be wrong? Because they only take one rule of interpretation. We looked at every rule. And every rule that balanced out with each other. 